Good morning. I'd like to invite everyone who would like to pledge allegiance to the land to stand up. Would you stand up, please? We need a little stand-up break sometimes in the middle of the service that way. I've heard that the uh, mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. <laughs> so I have one more we'll prayer. Heavenly Father, as we bring this teaching from your word to your people, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come, fill our hearts, fill our ears, fill our eyes, and fill our minds with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I have something here in my Bible that I want to show you. Um, I was thinking about putting it on the screen. But uh, I better just show it to you first. Right here I have something that is um, called The Wedding of Katja Stryker and Ryan Harmon. And it's Saturday, April 30th, 2022, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Tierra Verde. And there's going to be a dinner at this wedding. Now, why is this important to me? Because my stepdaughter, my husband's second born, is actually named Harmon. And so Ryan Harmon is our grandson. It's next week. We get to go to that next week. Now, I want to show you something else about this. Um, this is postmarked February 8th, 2022. February 8th on the postmark. So how long ago did I get that? Let's see. Today's actually the 23rd. So February, March, April, May, March, April. They sent out that invitation two months ago. Do you think that we responded to this? Do you think I sent my RSVP? Right away? Yes. Oh yes, I said it right away. I said, of course, because how nice of them to have their wedding, even though their this wedding invitation was sent from Grand Rapids, the wedding is taking place in Tierra Verde, which is just over at St. Pete, St. Petersburg, Florida. So we don't have to go to Michigan. We get to go. We didn't even used to go to Michigan until after Mother's Day because it would snow. And um, one of our Marty's other daughter. She told us two days ago, three days ago, it was snowing in um, Manistee, Michigan, where she lives. So, I get to go to a wedding. And I said yes. We said yes, didn't we, Marty? And we, we made arrangements with um, employers. I have an employer now. I get to make arrangements with my employer. And um, I'm excited. And I want to go. And it says dinner. So when I get there, I'm expecting that there'll be a little name place that'll say, you know, my name to sit at that table where I get to sit, right? Sometimes they fix that all up ahead of time. They fix it up so that, well, I was going to say I'm friends with Marty's ex, so it's not a problem for us. <laughs> but sometimes they fix things up so that people that might not get along together, get, a, get to sit together. And they fix it up so the people that get along together get to sit together. A wedding. Our Bible text today, Matthew 22, 1 through 3. And we've got this unusual uh, title, Insulting the Invitation with a Question Mark. It should have a question mark in your bulletin. Insulting the Invitation is the question. So I'm going to read to, well, first of all, I'd like to ask you to, would you open up your Bibles to a different Bible verse this time? And, and it's Luke 14. This is another version of this kind of a story that Jesus must have told as a parable of the Great Supper. Luke chapter 14 and verse 15. We're going to read through this real, very quickly. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And it's called the parable of the great supper. You'll notice that the parable, uh, the parallel passage in Matthew is Matthew 22. And verse 15 says this. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said to him, then Jesus said to him, 
A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them, and I ask you to have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master, and then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in there the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. That probably be the homeless, right? And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my side. Turn with me, uh, stay in that chapter, and go down to verse 33. Verse 33 says this, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Cannot means that it is an impossibility. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, it is an impossibility for him to be my disciple. Now come back, back to uh, Matthew, the 22nd chapter where we have this amazing story. <clears throat> we know God is love. And in this story, we hear some things that happen that make me wonder about God's lovingness. So in Matthew 22, we just heard the beginning of this, and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, said and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Now my son-in-law is quite a businessman, and I imagine this is going to be quite a wedding supper that we're going to get to go to. He's not a king. Well, industrial king, maybe. It's an important person, right? Important person. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now, this is something that I had never seen on this parable before, and I don't know why, but maybe you've never seen it either. I kind of thought that this wedding was uh, like a pop-up wedding or something, you know? Uh, he's having a wedding, and now he's going out and inviting people. But that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works for us, is it? I got my invitation in February, and this man had sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden, past tense, to the wedding, they would, and they would not come. And he sent, in New King James, he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. But they had been invited. Not at that moment that the servants went out. He went out to talk to the people who had already been invited. Now it gets better. And then he said, uh, let's see, this should advance. In Luke, where we just read, he said, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. So there is an advance invitation. They have accepted. And now he's, he makes the appropriate amount of food and beverage for those who had accepted. Is that what you understand from this? Mm -hmm. That's what I understand. Then he says, back in Matthew, again in verse 4, again he sent other servants talent, saying, tell them which are bidden, in other words, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. It's time. Come to the marriage. That thing I invited you to, it's ready. Come on. But they made light of it. And went their ways, went to his farm, 
another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Whoa. Whoa. These servants are coming with an invitation to go out to eat. It's all paid for. It's going to be good. Just exactly what you would like on your menu is what's going to be on that menu. And what's happening here? They made light of it. They went their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. That means they got killed. This was a king. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. Just another word for angry, very angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Meantime, he still got food. Because then he says to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid or invite to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways. Now, if I was a servant and the last time I went out, my buddies didn't come back because they were killed, this might make you a little timid. But these servants went out into the highways, and they gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Oh, nothing sadder than to be at a wedding, and there's nobody sitting there to watch the wedding. Sometimes they sit the men on one, or you know, the, the, the people that belong to the groom, or that are friends of the groom on one side, they sit the friends of the bride on the other side. And if the wedding is closer in geography to one set of uh, friends, there's like, you know, three or four sitting over here, and bam, this all side's full. People have given up that practice. But they went forth, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Ha, oh, guests. Guests which make your life feel appreciated. It means that, they, that they're, they're going to be there to witness what's going on. And when the king came into the guests, now, in those days, if you came to the wedding, you know, most of the time now you have to go to, to the tuxedo rental place, and the bride buys a great big dress, and then all the bridesmaids buy a dress, and that dress they probably never wear again because it doesn't match anything that they could possibly ever do again. So we, do we do special clothing when we have weddings today, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now we do special clothing when we have a wedding today, and in those days when you came to the foyer or wherever, maybe it was like getting a choir robe or something, I don't know. But they, you got something special to wear. Now these folks are coming from the highways and the byways, so I especially think that they needed something a little extra to throw on. You see what I'm saying here? But all of that, when they came in, there was one guy who at the door says, no, that's all right. My, what, I, what I am on is just fine. I don't want anything from you. My outfit is perfect. No worries. Keep your outfit. And yeah, there's a little stain here. And I'm, I, I've been on the ground. I'm in the highways and byways here. I'm a little dusty, but I'm not putting on your outfit. So when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. But now the king says to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And which one was speechless? The king or the guy? The guy. Man. This is the king. I mean, a lot of those guests, they're not getting talked to. I mean, they're just, you know, guests. And, and you don't always get to talk to the most important people at an important gathering. And this time, the king comes over to him. Who knows what he thought? Maybe he thought, the king's coming over to talk to me. <laughs> he's not talking to those guys. He's talking to me. I'm, I'm special. And the king asks him about what he's got on. And when he realizes what he's <clears throat> done, he has rejected the hospitality of the king. He, he really doesn't have anything to say. He's just like, 
I'm speechless. Well, this next part, not too fun. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. You know, I'm, I, uh, I wish that everybody, and in fact, if you do have uh, Ellen G. White on your phone or device, uh, you turn to Christ Object Lessons and you go to chapter 24. Uh, between chapter 18 and chapter 24 of Christ Object Lessons, there's so much built into that that I could have just read the whole thing <laughs> and you would have gotten a better day out of this understanding of this particular mind-stopping parable. This parable, when you think about God being love, doesn't sound too love. I've heard a lot of times people have talked about the wedding garment that he did not put on, but today we're not talking about that. We're going to have to save that for another time. We're just going to talk about the nature of the feast the feast, both feasts are provided with guests. And the second parable, the one from Matthew, shows that there is a preparation to be made. And in both parables, where the, the, there ends up being guests, there ends up be, being people who come to the, to the wedding uh, feast or to the big supper that was uh, the uh, important man has, it reminded me of last week, if you were here for our sermon with um, Miko, he talked about the fact that when all those angels followed one third of the angels, you know, left heaven and went down to uh, with Satan, end up being assigned to uh, earth as fallen angels, that that left a gap in the population of heaven. Isn't that an amazing thought that there was a gap in the population of heaven and that the creation of human beings after the fall of Satan was to repopulate heaven. Did you catch that when Miko talked about that last week? If you did, raise your hand. I want everybody to be awake. Okay, some of us heard that. What a thought that now God wanted some more people to be with him, some more beings to be with him, and so he created human beings, and, and the goal was that they were supposed to populate and re replenish the earth, and, and he would have made up for these uh, bad angels, these fallen angels, these wicked angels, these deceived angels that followed Satan out of heaven and one day will be destroyed, he was going to repopulate the earth. So the idea of having guests at the wedding feast, at the supper, is that there would be fellowship. There would be people. Do you know God covets your fellowship? He likes to be with you. He likes to know that you're thinking about Him, that you're reading about Him, that you're talking to Him, that you're listening to Him. God likes you. Oh, wait a minute. God loves you. He loves you so much that if you were the only person on the planet, He would have sent His Son to die for you. How do I know that? Because... The promise in Genesis 3.15 is that God would send a... Uh, what, Tarsia, what are we going to say? <laughs> yeah, in Genesis 3.15 is the first promise that there would be the seed of the woman and that the um, Satan might bruise that heel on the seed of the woman, but the, but the seed of the woman would crush Satan's head. Amen, he's a snake, and he crush his head. There was a lady that was a pastor's wife in a church I first went to. And she used to say, well, she used to say, Amen, to her husband's preaching. And I never will forget sister doing that. Amen, from the back of the church. It was so beautiful. And she, she also gave good instruction. And she said, give no place to the devil. She said, he belongs under your feet. That's where he belongs. So give no place to the devil. I got to go back. Yep. 
And everybody said amen. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say it like our sister said amen. it? Amen. 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 Give a little, little energy to your amen. So be it. And as we think about that, the guests, that was part of what God was doing in talking to about these guests. So in both parables, the feast is provided with guests. But the second, the Matthew parable, shows that there is a preparation to be made by all who attend the feast. Those who neglect this pre preparation are cast out. Now, the call to the feast had been given by Christ's disciples. And point number four is our Lord had sent out the twelve and afterward the seventy to preach, repent, and believe the gospel during the time that Jesus was alive on the earth. Well, the call was not heeded. The invitees did not come. Servants were sent out later to say, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattens are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. And this was the message born to the Jewish nation after the crucifixion of Christ. But the nation that claimed to be God's peculiar people rejected the gospel brought to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. And others were so exasperated by the offer of salvation, the offer of pardon for rejecting the Lord of glory, that they turned upon the bearers of the message. Acts 8.1 says there was a great persecution. Now, they rejected the offer of salvation. They rejected the offer of pardon for rejecting the Lord. What makes a person stay where they are instead of turning around and, re and going the way that God wants them to go? Self. Pride. Uh, you know, saving face. You want to save face? I was right. I was there in the Sanhedrin when they brought him there. And we heard him say with his own words that he was, you know, the Messiah, the King. It was blasphemy. And I don't care if he raised from the dead. I don't believe he raised from the dead. I think those soldiers stole his body. The disciples stole his body. All the lies that went along with rejecting the resurrection. Are we going to fix the air conditioning now? Is that what's happening? Maybe. I don't know. So when you think about what was going on right there, those, they were rejecting the, the uh, offer of salvation, the offer of pardon for rejecting the Lord of glory, that they turned upon the bearers of the message and there was a great persecution. In fact, the Lord's messengers such as Stephen and James were put to death. And thus, the people, the Jewish people, rejected, uh, sealed their rejection of God, God's message, God's offer. Now, when we were in Luke, we saw that somebody actually said, um, the third one, she said, he said that he had a wife. He, the third excuse had no semblance of reason. This is reading from Ellen White. And from the spirit of prophecy, the words that Jesus gave us to keep us on track. Amen? Amen. The fact that the intended guest had married a wife need not have present, prevented his presence at the feast. His wife must also have been made welcome. But he had his own plans for enjoyment, and there, these seemed to him more desirable than the feast he had promised to attend. Mm. There's that thought. That's what, that's what got me. He had promised to attend this feast. So we're talking about people who are professed believers of Christ. They're professed, at some points, they had said that they believe in Jesus. And he had learned to find pleasure in other society than that of the host. He didn't even ask to be excused, made, made not even a pretense of courtesy in his refusal. The I cannot was only a veil for the truth. I do not care to come. All the excuses betray a preoccupied mind. To these intended guests, other interests had become all absorbing. The invitation they had pledged themselves to accept was put aside. And the generous friend was insulted by their indifference. By the Great Supper, Christ represents the blessings offered through the Gospel. The provision is nothing less than Christ Himself. He is the bread that comes down from heaven, and from Him the streams of salvation flow. 
The Lord's messengers had proclaimed to the Jews the advent of the Savior. They had pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. Remember, John the Baptist stood there and he saw Jesus, his cousin, who he really didn't know that well. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In the feast he had provided, God offered to them the greatest gift that heaven can bestow, a gift that is beyond computation. The love of God had furnished the costly banquet and had provided inexhaustible resources. John 6, verse 51 says, If any man eat of this bread, Christ said, he shall live forever. Amen. Eternal life. What were they turning down? Not just the food but the food that Jesus represented, the bread of life. But in order to accept the invitation to the gospel feast, they must make their worldly interests subordinate to the one purpose of receiving Christ in his righteousness. God gave all for man, and he asks him to place his service above every earthly and selfish consideration. He cannot, God cannot accept a divided heart, the heart that is absorbed in the earthly affections cannot be given up to God. And the lesson for all is for all time. We are to follow the Lamb of God whithersoever He goes. His guidance is to be chosen, His companionship valued above the companionship of earthly friends. Christ says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, Matthew 10, 37. Are we supposed to love our, our, our family? Yes. Yeah. So this can't mean that you don't love your family. This, can't, this just has to mean that we don't make an idol of our children, idol of our husband, idol of our wife, idol of those those relatives of ours that we really want to keep the peace with because the last time we tried to talk to them about the Sabbath day they wouldn't talk to us for like three months and we felt bad and it was you know it was not going to be a good reunion to see them again and so you know I kind of value I kind of value that relationship I'm, I'm just not going to say anything in fact I personally have practiced so long not saying anything to my relatives for fear of ruffling, ruffling their feathers, for fear of stirring up the water, for fear of them not being a, a, a able or wanting to talk to me again, that I am asking myself at my age, have I really witnessed to my family? Have I really given them the call? Have I really shown them something? You know, it's kind of bad when one of your friends, one of your good, good sisters, real sister, blood sister, ends up saying, I thought all Adventists had to be vegetarian in order to become Adventists. Oh, no. oh, is that all I told them? Is that all they got out of this? Shakes you up, doesn't it? To know what somebody else might be thinking about your faith? Yeah, I made sure that whenever they had a gathering, I said, well, we won't be there on Saturday. But if you have it on Sunday, we can come. That's what they knew, you know? That's what they know. I think they know more. And I think it really ruffles their feathers. Because if they really know more and they really have to follow, then they're going to be in harmony with all ten of God's commandments. Amen? Amen? That's one of the blessings that I have, is being in harmony with God's ten commandments. He's written them in my heart, Hebrews 10. And now they're in my heart, and it's what I want to do. And I'm not breaking this holy day every week like I was. It feels good to know that he, shared, he took the time to share that with me, this wonderful Sabbath day truth. And it's what's going to make us be that peculiar people in the end, Amen. in the end of time. If you want to think about it, it's not going to be because you're a vegetarian, because there's a whole bunch of New Age people that are vegetarians and vegans, and they won't even eat bee uh, products. They're, they're, um, they're not like my friend Ray said. Ray said he's a vegan, which means he will eat bee products, honey. Yeah, we invented that term laughing some point a while ago. There's going to be, it's not because of that, that we're going to um, be the light of the world. Right? So here I am, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me 
is not worthy of me, Matthew 10, 37, around the family board, when breaking their daily bread, many in Christ's day repeated the words, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Christ showed how difficult it was to find guests for the table provided at infinite cost. Those who listened to his words knew that they had slighted the invitation of mercy. By the way, if you go back to this and you see where Jesus was, some point he was like at the um, Pharisees' table. Let me go back.